Okay, uh, good morning, guys. Um, nice seeing uh, many familiar faces, um, just like the previous years. Um, so today I'll be trying to share some of the things, uh, what we are doing, where the field is moving, um, especially focusing on the uh, high performance and scalable designs of the programming models. Uh, so we just heard from PASA about the open SMEM, but I'll try to take a broader view of the programming models, starting from API to, to open SMEM, uh, to UPC, uh, hybrid MPI open SMEM, and not only just the programming models, but how do we really design um, these things on the modern system. So this chart, uh, many of you might have seen, this is the data taken from the top 500 list, uh, which is trying to um, show how the field is moving. And of course, it is a, the y-axis is in the performance in a logarithmic scale, and this is linear. So especially the field is moving in an exponential manner. And uh, so this line, which is trying to show the number one system in the world, how it is evolving over the years, uh, the latest system is the, the Tihane 2, uh, which is 33 petaflop system. And uh, this line is trying to show the cumulative performance of all these systems. And then this one is trying to show the, the bottom most in the top 500 list. And, uh, and we see a very nice trend um, over the years. But the, but the bigger challenge is coming like how to reach the 100 petaflop barrier. And that's what is being planned. You heard about some of the machines being put together. That will be the 100 petaflop. Um, the target is somewhere like 2016 or 2017 kind of time frame we'll be seeing. And then, the, of course, the next broader goal is to hit the exaflop. And a lot of discussions are taking place, lots of challenges. And I'll be trying to uh, bring some of those challenges here. Now, out of this um, top 500 systems, if you see what is happening with respect to a, an interesting trend where the clusters are being placed. So this data is taken from the top 500. Uh, if you see, like, this y-axis is trying to show the number of systems out of those 500 which are commodity clusters. Okay? So, so in the old days, you will see that most of the systems were proprietary. But in the, since, like, 2000 onwards, like, the cluster started picking up. And now, if you see the latest November 14th ranking, we have 86% of the system are clusters. So these are like commodity clusters. So that means you can put together commodity servers and some commodity networking technologies. And you have one of the top systems in the 500 list. So that is a very interesting trend. And of course, how these systems are being designed, if you see the commodity components, so broadly we see not only like multi-core processors, and especially commodity networks like InfiniBand, and also the accelerators and coprocessors, both from the NVIDIA side as well as from the Intel, uh, Intel Mic side. Uh, they, are, uh, they are contributing to a lot of performance. And this is how you see all the systems, like the TNA2, Titan, Stampede, TNA1A. All of them belong to the, the same category. On the InfiniBand side, this is the <coughs> data taken from the November 2014 list. Um, so here we see around like 45% of the systems, uh, 225 of them are InfiniBand clusters. Just in the top 50, we have 21 systems. And uh, on the seventh rank is the TAC Stampede system. And that actually utilizes not only the, the Intel Geon, but also the Intel Mic, and also the InfiniBand FDR. So three of the latest um, uh, technologies to put together. And if you compute the cores, it is like the, both the mini core from the Intel Mic as well as from the Geon core, it's, it has crossed half million. So here we are seeing like a system with half million cores. And of course, there are other systems which are being deployed uh, throughout the world in this commodity environment. So, so if you take a look at these this commodity clusters, of course, how do we program them? And how do we really exploit performance from these systems. And in this context, I can try to divide it into two different categories. One is the scientific computing. This is what I'll be talking today, which primarily focuses like the MPI or MPI OpenMP and this PGAS or hybrid programming. Of course, the next field which is emerging is the big data, enterprise, commercial computing, where we focus on Hadoop, Spark, Memcached, et cetera. And that's what I'll be talking tomorrow. There is another talk, so I'll purely focus on the big data in the tomorrow's talk. Um, so this is a chart trying to show where we are in the exascale 
um, um, field. So this chart is taken uh, from Professor Jack Dangara. So if you, what it shows is like, let's say these are some different metrics like system peak, power, system memory, node performance, node concurrency, total node interconnect bandwidth, system size, and concurrency. How these parameters are there for the number one system in the world now, that is the Tiahane 2, and where we want to be in the exascale system when it comes, and what is the factor of difference, okay? And that shows, like, uh, some of you might have seen in an older chart of this, that was like the beginning when they had like 2010 machines and then the, the exact scale, and now this, this slide has been um, upgraded. So let's just focus a few of these things. Um, so here you see like, let's say, node concurrency. Uh, the current system, we have like 24 cores CPU and 171 cores coprocessor, and the plan is to really have 1,000 or 10,000 of such cores within a node. This will be really powerful node. Um, in the exascale systems, and here we'll be seeing like a factor of five or 50. A big difference we'll be seeing when we have these exascale systems. So similarly like that, the nodes will be much more powerful here. If you see the node interconnect bandwidth, it's around like six gigabytes per second, and the plan is to go to 200 to 400 gigabytes per second. So that means the field has to improve by another factor of 40 or 60, just from the networking bandwidth perspective. So similarly, like system size, um, currently this has 16,000 nodes, and the plan will be that almost 100,000 or 1 million of such nodes will be there. So there is a lot of challenge here to, to improve this, this uh, parameter by a factor of 6 to 60. And then, of course, the total concurrency. So once we have these, like the, the CPU cores and then the, uh, the um, main, many integrated cores, now the question is how many threads will be able to run. So in this system, the Tiahane 2, we have around like 3.12 million uh, threads, and the aim is to really go for order of billion, okay? And that is primarily for latency hiding, because in all these kind of systems, we will be encountering a lot of this memory wall. Access to the memory will be so expensive, so you cannot just have like one single thread waiting for the data to come, okay? So then you will be losing all the resources, so you need high degrees of concurrency with multi-threading so that you should be able to exploit the, the, the performance. So we'll keep this in mind in the background, but now let's see what is happening in the, in the parallel programming um, domain. And most of you are familiar with the distributed memory model, which is the MPI, the message passing interface. That has been the common paradigm for most of these systems. Of course, shared memory model is there, um, the standard shared memory, which is the CAS coherent. And uh, there, the, there is a limit uh, to, to increase to the number of cores. So what people are proposing is to go into this partition global address space, or the PGAS, which encompasses a lot of these kind of models, global arrays, UPC, Chapel, X10, um, CAF, et cetera. And not only like these, these separate models are there, so here the idea is to have a logical shared memory. So physically, you have the distributed memory, but on top of that, you are trying to provide a logical shared abstraction so that you can do actually any process can do read and write kind of things. And Pasa indicated some of these through uh, his examples um, in the context of OpenSmith. So let's say see the broad challenges. If we put together the programming models and our exascal system goals, so this is what we'll see. The biggest challenge is this energy and power. And as um, uh, Brian indicated, like there's a focus here um, saying the societal impact. And, and the way you will see these exascal systems, it is the, the power. That will be the biggest issue. And then the question is, how do we design this kind of programming models and their underlying run system to consume the least amount of power while trying to deliver the best performance and scalability will be the biggest contributions from this field uh, to, to the society in the next decade. So, so here, of course, not only do we want to solve the power requirements for the data movement, we also want to see that we want to achieve high capacity and high data rate for both memory and storage. And this is where that concurrency challenge comes in, and also locality. When you have so many billions of threads, not only you want to hide the latency, you also want to exploit locality. So that means when they are in the same processor or the same uh, compute unit, they should be able to share the data which have been fetched uh, from the remote plane. And of course, the resiliency challenge is, is also very big because all these systems, what we are talking is, is commodity in nature. So that means the components are going to fail. So the, how do we actually handle the, uh, the resilience? 
So in this context, so first let's try to see what is MPI doing, okay? Because MPI has been very common. People have been trying to use it for, for last uh, 20, 30 years. So how MPI is evolving to, to handle these exhaustive challenges? So the, some of the components, what is being introduced, and I'll go into a little bit more details on that. The first one is called non-blocking collectives. <coughs> so if some, if some of you would have programmed MPI, you would have seen that not only you have like point-to-point -point communication, but you also have collective communications. So that means a lot of processes participate. So these are operations like all to all, reduce, all reduce, scatter, gather, a bunch of such collectives are there. And in fact, these are the collectives which take a lot of time because coordinating so many processes, you have to exchange a lot of messages. And not only it is data intensive, it also power intensive, okay? Because this is that the time, if you think mostly the MPI runtime, use polling based designs. So this is the time where you are not getting the data, you are continuously polling, and then you are consuming power, okay? So, so the plan is to actually come up with uh, non-blocking collectives. Currently, everything is blocking. So that means if you introduce some all to all, unless the all to all gets finished, nobody is able to proceed, okay? Whereas in the non-blocking collective semantics, what it will try to do is you introduce all to all or initiate all to all, but then, the computation can proceed, provided you have data from the previous iteration, okay? And then you wait for the all to all to get done, and then proceed with the next iteration. So in that way, you can really overlap your computation with, with communication, and I'll show some examples later on. And then the other thing which is happening, <coughs> excuse me, the traditional MPI has been the two-sided operations. That means send and receive. So I send and then you receive kind of thing. And that also requires more synchronization. And now the new designs are coming, uh, especially in the MPI-3 standard is the RMA, remote memory access. MPI-2 had some of these one-sided operations, but they were not very uh, high performance, and they have been revisited. And then the MPI-3 RMA is trying to provide um, um, highly efficient um, communication with reduced synchronization. And then to manage concurrency, this is where the programming models are coming. Uh, with PGAS, like the UPC, Global Arrays, OpenSMEM, and CAF, and, and the resiliency. So this is where the MPI forum is trying to um, aim. And as some of you know, like the MPI 3 um, got introduced like um, three years back at the supercomputing time. So MPI 3, a lot of MPI um, runtimes uh, have already implemented MPI 3. Uh, most of the MPI stacks, they, they provide this, this kind of a support. And these are the kind of things, non-blocking collectives and improve one-sided RMA model. They are already available. And then the new thing also, which is MPI-3 introduced called MPI tools interface. And I'll go through a little bit later with, with some examples. And, uh, and you can download this MPI-3 spec uh, from, from this uh, URL. And the MPI 3.1 and 4 are underway. So in fact, the, uh, the MPI forum is meeting next, uh, uh, next month. Uh, so the MPI 3.1 is almost coming to the close, and it will be approved. So you'll see the MPI 3.1. And these are mostly not big changes, very small, small changes uh, to the MPI-3. But then the, after that, the effort will be going into the, uh, to the MPI-4. So in this particular things, the partition global address space to continue on some of the discussion, uh, what PASA had, the broad objective is to have simple shared memory abstractions, light one-sided communication, and the easier to express irregular communication. So the MPI is good for regular communication if you understand the pattern. Of the, of the applications, then it is much more write, easier to write the MPI uh, program. But then if you have your application, which is very irregular, then it is very hard to write in the MPI. On the other hand, if you try to use the PGAS, it becomes much more um, easier. And there are different approaches uh, to PGAS, like the Unified Parallel C, Core A Fortran. These are like the language-based approach. There is also a library-based approach, OpenSMEM. So I'll touch three of these later on, the UPC, CAF, and, and, and OpenSMEM. Now, not only that, just the PGAS is emerging. Now, people have been starting to think how to combine MPI and PGAS to take the complementary strengths from both of these models so that the, the end users will have the complete flexibility. So here, you can think of like all these modern systems. Nowadays, we are seeing these are hierarchical architecture. So that means you will have now, you, now itself is hierarchies there, multiple hierarchy, and it will get more hierarchies will be coming. So that means we have. Within a node, we have several <coughs> sockets. Within the sockets, we have cores. 
Then across, the, we, we take multiple of those nodes to a server blades. Then the servers are being connected together into a box. Then we go into different racks. So, so there is a lot of these hierarchies. Now the question is, can we take this kind of an approach, saying, let's say, different kinds of address spaces. So we can do MPI across address space and PGAS within an address space. And MPI is good at moving data between address spaces. And then within an address space, MPI can interoperate with other shared memory programming models. Okay? And that doesn't actually avoid uh, using OpenMP. OpenMP can still coexist. I mean, that is a very common MPI plus OpenMP a lot of people are currently using. That is for offloading the computation. But here, what we are saying is the communication itself can also be shared. Like the MPI, at some of the communications you can do with MPI, and some of the others you can do with PGAS. And I'll show some very concrete examples later on how you can really take some applications and try to use both of these models together to get much more performance and scalability. And so the idea here is that if the applications can have kernels with different communication patterns, they can benefit with this hybrid approach. Of course, some people can say, yeah, we can always rewrite application. But that is very hard. I mean, so many of these applications have been there for many years. It's very hard to, to take an MPI program. And you will need, again, years to, to actually go and rewrite in, a, in, in some kind of a PGAS. But, but if there is a provision to combine, and that's what I illustrate here in the next slide as an illustration. So think of like a, you have a big code base with a lot of these different modules or different kernels. And you might be seeing that on very large scale system, it doesn't scale. Okay? So might be if you just inspect it, you will see that it is only like some of these models, some of these kernels might not be scaling. Okay? So it might be some particular library or some particular pattern which is not done well for that system. So the question is, if we change these two PGAS, only those kernels, and then stitch them together, then we should be able to actually run this application uh, much more efficiently. And this is where we can take the benefits of both of the distributed computing as well as the uh, shared memory computing model. Okay? And once again, towards the end, I'll try to show some concrete examples of what we have done in our group. But of course, to, to achieve this, you need a unified runtime. And that also I'll be talking. Okay? That means the, the runtime should be able to allow you to run not only just MPI application, PGAS applications, it also should be able to run both MPI and PGAS applications together. Okay? Otherwise, you cannot um, achieve this. So, so with this kind of like a background and objective, so now let's try to take a bigger picture of if we want to design communication libraries, how do we want to do it? What are the challenges? So I'll start with some bottom components like the multi-core, many-core architectures, or let's say networking technologies like InfiniBand or Ares or OmniScale. All these things are happening or will be happening soon. And then we have accelerators. Okay? So these I call like a supply side. So that means these components are coming um, from, the, from the industry. Then of course there is the <coughs> demand side. We want to deliver example of performance for these applications. And applications are written sometimes in the middleware. And then the middleware are sitting on top of the programming models. So whatever the programming models we introduced here, all these MPI, PGAS, or even CUDA, OpenACC, Silk, even for the big data Hadoop, MapReduce, they, they lie here. So now the challenge is, if we want to get the performance here, of course, we need to deliver the performance at this layer so that the end users can actually take advantage of this. And then we need to bridge the gap, like take all the features from these components and then try to try to link it to the uh, programming models. And this is where the runtime uh, comes in, whether it is an MPI library, or it is a PGAS runtime, or it is a hybrid PGAS runtime. And then here inside, you will see all these different kinds of designs for point-to-point, -point collective, synchronization, IO file system, fault tolerance. So this is where all the things have been, have been put together. So we'll take this, this, this broader look. And at the same time, we'll also see as modern systems are being complicated, it is becoming very hard to just work on one particular layer to get the performance. So a lot of co-design opportunities are coming, um, and, and that leads to a lot of challenges across the various layers. And if we can do these co-designs properly, we should be able to get also performance, scalability, and fault tolerance. And I'll show some examples, especially for like non-blocking collectives. How do you take like an offload-based hardware and also modify the applications. If we put all these things together, then you will see you will get significant performance improvements. I'll show some concrete 
um, examples. So, so if you take in general, like what people have been talking, like let's say MPI plus X, <coughs> this X could be just as simple as open MP, or it could be more complicated, like the PGAS, uh, what we discussed, like the, the open SMEM or UPC and all. So you can come up with this kind of a broad challenges. Okay. So first is, of course, we want to have scalability for million to billion processes. Um, that means we need very highly efficient internode and internode communication, both two-sided and one-sided. And as I indicated, like this collective communication takes a lot of time, and that's most of the time limits the performance and also consumes a lot of power. So there are a lot of challenges here to how do we take advantages of offloaded networks, the non-blocking MPI3, or let's say do some topology aware and then power aware designs. And also, how do you balance the communication? Like these days, I showed some examples, like the within the node, we'll have 1,000 to 10,000 cores. And that means a lot of communication will happen within the node. Okay? So not only we need to optimize that, we need to balance it out with the communication which is to be taking place across the network. And for that, we need to have efficient multi-threading. And the other challenge which is coming, as we are moving into these GPGPUs and accelerators, you cannot just design runtime in a decoupled manner. The, most of the runtimes have been designed in the past with a CPU-centric. But now you need to bring these accelerators, NVIDIA GPUs and Intel Mic together. And I'll show some examples like how you can really design this in an integrated manner. Uh, fault tolerance, uh, quality of service support, and then the support for hybrid MPI PGAS programming. And the final thing is virtualization. A lot of you might be knowing virtualization has a lot of advantage, but it has not really come to the HPC because virtualization has overhead. Okay? It has some benefits, but it also has some overhead. So there's a lot of discussion going on how we can combine virtualization with HPC. And I'll show you some of the work, what we have done, combining with the, with the, the InfiniMand SRIOB technology together with MPI, so that we can give you performance very close to the native InfiniMand, okay, within 3 to 8%. Okay? Currently, the, the deployments, if you see with virtualization, it has almost 25 to 30% overhead. Okay, so that's why it doesn't really come benefit us the HPC side, whereas if you use some very advanced design, you should be able to come to very closely to the, to the native. Any questions so far? Everybody is awake? That's the most important. Yes, no, I, I agree. So technology will keep on moving, but if you go back to this, this I said, if things can be, this is where the programming models, if you think that is like a more or less a standard, let's say MPI-3 or MPI-4. So it doesn't matter what happens inside, if we can actually unify at this layer, then it becomes much more easier for the application. The same thing, let's say PGAS. Think of open SMEM or UPC or, or even hybrid. We need to unify at this layer. We cannot do anything at the lower layer then there will be all different kinds of solutions will be coming out. Yes. I'll come to non-blogging collectives. I have some more slides. I'll, I'll go into more detail. Yes. I'll, there are slides. Well, I'll come to that. Just hold on, like another 20 slides, it'll, it'll come. Okay. The, these sites are very active. How about questions from this side? No question? Either they have all understood or they have not understood anything. Okay. Don't care state. You know, digital logic, there is a yes and no. You don't care. So let's, let's move ahead. So, <clears throat> so the additional thing, not just like performance and, um, and scalability, the additional challenges, I, I try to write it here. The one thing we need to take care of is extreme low memory footprint. This is becoming very important. As we know, with this multi-core and many-core, the memory per core continues to decrease. 
Okay, I mean, think of like the many core, um, the Intel mic. I mean, we have so many cores, but just eight gigabytes of memory, or the next generation will have 16 gigabytes. So per core, you will see, it is very small. And same thing is happening also with the host. So now the question is, when this, the amount of memory per core is decreasing, when you design these runtimes, our program models provide the support, the question is how much memory that runtime itself is consuming, okay? So you need to be sensitive to that fact. If your runtime takes a lot of memory, then your application doesn't have a lot of memory to work with. So there is always a tug of war which is going on. So we need to design this with respect to extreme low memory footprint. Then the additional thing which is becoming more important and will also become more complex as we proceed, I call it like a DLA framework, okay? So what is happening is this, as the systems are becoming more complex, the, the runtime has to follow these kind of steps. That means discover, so that means as it is running, you need to discover what is happening, like what is the overall network topology? What is the network topology for processes for a given job? What is the node architecture? Health of the networks and node? So as soon as the job starts running, you need to get a lot of this information. Okay? And not only that, you need to also learn inside the library or the runtime, saying what is the impact on performance and scalability? What will be the potential for failure? And then you need to quickly adapt. Okay? So these are the three stages. Like you need to adapt internal protocols and algorithms, you may need to do this, adapt the process mapping, you may need to adapt fault tolerant solutions, then only you should be able to, to deliver that performance, scalability, and the fault tolerance. Okay? It is just like, think of like a driving in this Bay Area, right, on a congested road. I mean, it's continuously looking for your radio or something is happening, the traffic jam. So while you are driving, you are taking a lot of decisions. Okay? It is not a static. You don't say that, yeah, I always go from this route to that place, always using the same freeway. We don't do that. The same similar kind of things we need to think the next generation systems need to have okay? to, to provide you the best performance and scalability and fault tolerance, and I'll show some examples later on. But at the same time, in order to achieve this, you need to have low overhead techniques. Okay? Because if these techniques take a lot of overhead, then you kill your performance. So you need to have very nice schemes or so that you can do it in a lightweight manner, and that can offset the, the type of benefits what we can see with the, with the newer scheme. So in this context, let me explain like some of the things what we are doing. Some of you might be familiar. We have been in this field for many years now. Uh, this is the MapH um, stack. Um, we started this project almost from day one of InfiniMan. Uh, prior to this, we had done a lot of work on uh, Miricom, Quadrix, the previous generation interconnects. So we first made this available, our software stack, in 2002. Um, that was MPI-1, and then over the years we have made MPI-2, MPI-3. And since uh, 2012, we have this mvapis 2 x version, which actually combines the MPI and PGAS. And I'll, to your question, I'll give you some more concrete details there. And then since last year, we have been like trying to provide very integrated support of our MPI stack, both for NVIDIA GPUs as well as for Intel Mic and I'll try to show you how we have done those kind of designs. And this is very widely used uh, all over the world, um, not just from the download and the number of organizations, but at the same time, it is also empowering a lot of these top 500 clusters over the last uh, 15 years. Now, here I put some data. If some of you remember, like in the very early stage of InfiniMan, there was a Virginia Tech System X. Okay, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that system. That was the very first system, one of the first systems in InfiniMan. It was only 2,200 processors. The cores had also not come that time. It was only delivering like 12, uh, 25 teraflop. And since that, compared to that, now the stampede in the 2014, almost half a million cores with five petaflops. So, so we have been able to like through the same stack over the last 15 years, we have been able to push the performance as the technology is moving or the field is moving. We have been able to have continuous innovations in the, in the MPI stack to deliver this kind of performance. Okay? And that's what we plan to do also, also in the future. So I'll take very concrete examples from our stack to, to illustrate some of the concept or the challenges. But of course, you will see similar kind of solutions being available also with the, with, with, with the other stacks. So I'll try to cover some of the scalability aspect, then collective communication aspect, integrated support for GP, GPUs, mics, then I'll introduce this MPIT interface, which I didn't uh, talk earlier. Then I'll go into some of this unified runtime, 
for the hybrid MPI and PGAS. And then I'll illustrate some examples how you can combine uh, like the MPI with OpenSMEM, MPI with UPC, and trying to deliver the performance. And, and I'll touch some of the virtualization with HPC uh, towards the end. So this chart actually is trying to show how over the years different kinds of technologies, the especially instrument technology we see broadly from the, from the Mellanox side and, and from the QLogic, uh, which has been acquired by Intel. Over the years, like these are like the QLogic DDR, QDR, this is the ConnectX DDR, this is ConnectX2, ConnectX3, um, Sandy, ConnectIB, Dual FDR, uh, this is the IV bridge with Dual FDR, and the, the left hand is showing uh, the small message latency. That means half of round trip. So at an MPI level, if I send you a message and then you send me back and divide by two, so that's the half round trip. And you will see over the years, it has been steadily decreasing, so we are currently around one microsecond. And I'm waiting for the EDR adapters. Once it comes, then we'll try to plug in the numbers here, and then we'll see. Uh, I am hoping the, with the EDR adapter, it'll, the performance will be, will be even better. And then on the right-hand side, it's the bandwidth. That means the rate at which I can send the data from the one node to the other node. And here you can see clearly, like, this is the DDR, this is the QDR, this is the FDR, uh, this is the dual FDR, which is like 12.8 gigabytes per second. So you multiply by eight, so it is 100 gigabits per second. So this is what exactly the commodity networking is trying to provide you now. Okay? So any, any of the different kinds of installations, you can actually try to run similar kind of uh, uh, experiments and get these numbers. Now that is across the node, but as I said, as we are going into a lot of high density um, systems, the communication within the node also makes a big impact. Because if you think of like the modern servers, with the 32 core, 48 cores are there. A lot of communication, MPI communication happens within the node. If you don't optimize the performance, then you may not be able to get the, the performance of the applications for the larger scale systems. So in our design, we continuously also provide newer innovations to the intra-node MPI design. And this is trying to show, like uh, this is on the Intel IV Bridge platform with the latest MIBIS 2, 2.1 RC1. This is intra-socket. So that means within the socket, if there are two cores, they are able to communicate at an MPI level, the latency is 180 nanoseconds. Okay? So we have now gone into that like a nanoseconds design level uh, to, to, to make sure that you provide the appropriate buffers, appropriate controls, all those kind of things to really optimize the communication within the node. And then this is happening like <coughs> this is the inter-socket. So that means there are two sockets on the same node. And then the communication there, we, we get around 450 nanoseconds. So that is for the short messages. Now for the long messages, here we try to also provide solution. If you go through the basic shared memory, that is the blue line, you may not get the best performance. So to deliver higher performance, because the basic shared memory is like a two copy. That means you write, one process is writing to the shared memory, the other process is trying to read. So two copies are involved. So instead of that, many years back we introduced a module called LIMIC. Okay? So it is a, like a Linux-assisted kernel module, which can do like a single copy. Okay? So that has been there for many years. A lot of systems use, utilize this. But very recently, similar kind of things is available actually in the default Linux kernel. Okay? That is called CMA, or cross-memory attached. So since last two years, we have that module also available, the CMA support. So and with that, you can see like this is the intra-socket bandwidth, or the, this is the inter-socket bandwidth, you can get significant performance improvement. So, so I'll strongly suggest, if you have not been turning on these features, um, you should turn on these features and you should, you should see your performance improve significantly, especially if it is using a lot of large messages um, in, in, the, in the system. The similar kind of thing, this is like a MPI-3. Uh, I, included, I indicated like the, the remote memory access, that's the one-sided operation, which is the MPI-3 standard brings in, and we provide the full MPI-3 RMA support. So here are some examples. It's like the MPI-3 get and put with, with flush. So this is like a put performance. We can give you around like a 1.56 uh, microseconds, or within the node, it's almost like a 0.08 uh, microsecond kind of things. And, and the bandwidth, we again, this is across the node. We give it at the full um, uh, FDR uh, speed here. Um, uh, just like whatever we can give you for two-sided, we can also try to give you for the, uh, the one-sided. Now, those are with respect to the performance. 
for internode and intranode. But then I also indicated about this memory footprint. And that is becoming also very important. Like as the system size are scaling, how exactly you want to minimize the memory footprint while trying to give you the best performance. So here, we try to actually take advantage of several of these transport protocols which uh, are being provided. As you know, the InfiniBand, the, the common one is called RC. Um, the other one is the UD, unreliable datagram. Then there is an extended RC which came, and the next, very latest one is the DC, the direct connect transport. Okay? So these are the different kinds of transport protocols actually help to, to see how many connections you are establishing, and for each connection, how many buffers you provide, because that actually determines the memory footprint of, of your library. So what we have done here, it's like uh, over the years, of course, the XRC delivers better than, than RC. Um, it shows like here the basic memory megabyte per process. And here it's trying to show some uh, application performance with NAMD. But what we have done here is a hybrid design. Okay? So, so think of like I give this example of like a hybrid car. So just in the hybrid car, you know, like you want to get the best um, um, uh, consumption, the best miles per gallon. Okay? So you are trying to change between the usage in the gas and then usage in the electrics. The similar kind of things we internally do. So we have a hybrid mode. You can just turn it on, just putting a like the runtime variable like this. And what it does is internally it keeps track of who is communicating with whom. Okay? Even if you think for a very large scale system, let's say 10,000 core system, you run an MPI job, not that everybody talks to everybody else in your end job, okay? unless it does an all to all. Okay? But not all the applications do all to all. Most of them, they are like near neighbor, 2D, 3D, some stencil. So we try to monitor that. And, and those who are communicating frequently, we use RC connection, okay? Because that gives you the, the best performance. Whereas the other ones, we try to use through UD, okay? And, and it's totally adaptable. The, the runtime itself learns. So this is the, like the DLA framework I, I indicated earlier. It discovers itself. You just have to turn on this, okay? But of course, what we have done is this is since a generalized library, we have provided some set of parameters it may work with your application in a reasonable manner, or it might have better potential also. Okay? So if you are running for a very large scale jobs and you want to push the performance even further, there are a lot of runtime parameters. They are in our user guide. You can take a look at them and tune them. Uh, but if not, uh, you can get back to us and we can work with you to, to make sure that, that this uh, framework actually tries to give you the best performance with the best memory footprint. So then recently we have done this study with the DC transport. That is a newer thing which is coming out. It's not yet available. Uh, might be in the three, four months, the next release of MAP is 2 will have this. So here if you see, this is the, the uh, memory footprint for all 12. And I think tomorrow morning there is a keynote talk by Rich Graham. I, I, I'm sure he will, he will talk some of these more details um, about the DC. But here, um, some examples if you see, this is like the, the connection memory. And uh, for an all to all up to 640 processes, you will see that this is the RC, this is the UD, this is XRC, but you see the DC pool. That is the lowest amount of memory we are trying to use. Okay? So that means using this, this DC transport, we should be able to substantially reduce the memory footprint of any MPI library. <coughs> and also at the same time, here you will see it also delivers the, the best performance also. Okay? Because you have like less number of connections to play around, um, you are trying to look for like less number of buffers. All these things add up to, to, the, uh, to the best uh, overall performance. So now next, uh, next touch me, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, let me touch with some of the collective communication aspects. Now I'll touch four angles here. So one is of course the hardware multicast. As you know, the InfiniBand has a hardware multicast. Uh, so that means given a data, you should be able to send it through the network in a hardware manner. So this is the number taken from the tag stampede so here you will see that it's in 102,000 cores. And, and this is the default uh, broadcast design, which is the software, like a binomial, k-nomial kind of designs. But if you use the hardware support, you significantly reduce. And here we see like almost 5 to, to 10 microseconds, uh, we, can, we can send you data up to 102,000 cores. Okay? And, and here it shows like the, as the system size increases, so here you'll see that for 16 byte messages, the cost remains almost flat, like five microseconds. Okay, it doesn't increase with, with the system size. 
And for the large data messages, you see also similar kind of a uh, flat behavior. So we have this feature in the MAPIS too. So if you have infinite hardware you are running, just turn on the hardware multicast. And not only it will improve the broadcast um, performance, it will also improve uh, performance of several other collectives which are built on broadcast. Okay? So once again, if you are not taking advantage of this feature, you should be able to, to do that. Now next, let me come up with this non-blocking. I think you had some questions. So the non-blocking collectives, even though like MPI3 standard introduced, you remember I said it allows you to do overlap of computation with communication. That means you initiate the non-blocking call, whereas the computation can proceed, provided you have some data from the previous iteration. So what it means that your application needs to be modified. Okay, the current generation application you cannot just run and use non-blocking collectives and expect performance. So that is the first thing. Now the second thing is when these non-blocking collectives have been initiated, who is going to make progress? Okay, because many times you just don't send to everybody. Like there are different algorithms like a tree structure or some ring, different underlying implementation. So somebody has to make the progress. You can always do the progress through software, but then you need some threads. And if you are using through software-based progress, then your computation is not making progress. Okay? So here the ideal combination is to use the offloaded things. And this is what like the InfiniBand, uh, Mellanox InfiniBand provides the core direct support. So what we have done here, these are the studies, you can take a look at the papers. We really worked with some end scientists, so in the, from the Lawrence Livermore and all, and at the same time put the core direct and we modified the MPI layer. So this is the core design I was talking. So, so we are working with applications, the library, and then the actual hardware. Okay? And if you do see that, so here we modified like a P3D FFT, and here we see like the, for different data size, we get around 17% improvement. Here it is like a pre-conjugate gradient solver. Um, again, this then offload with all reduce. We can give like a 21% benefit. And here even HPL, very simple HPL also, we can, give you around like a 4.5% improvement. Okay? So through these kind of a co-designs, you can actually try to not only utilize the MPI non blocking collectives, but then try to, to deliver good performance while trying to exploit the overlap of computation with, with, with communication. Then the next thing is also the, from the collective angles, which is coming, which is becoming very important, is like topology aware. Okay? Now think of like, let's say you have a large scale uh, um, um, cluster, okay? I mean, you name any, any of the large scale like Stampede or Gordon or any of these large scale system, you as an user might be running, let's say, some 4,000 core job, okay? You just launch, but typically the scheduler never gives you 4,000 core contiguous allocation. Most of the schedulers are trying to, trying to provide you the best throughput, so they may give you like 1,000 cores here, 1,000 cores here, 1,000 cores here on that large scale system. So then what happens is, when you run these jobs, your traffic is containing with, with the traffic from the, from the other job. And this is where you see the variation. If you, if you run the job on the same system in 10 times, you will see always fluctuation. Okay. Now the question is, when people have designed the collective algorithms within an MPI library, the first assumption is that it is a contiguous allocation. Okay. All the algorithms, whatever, whatever has been designed, the, the ring, um, binomial, canomial, all are based on the same assumption. So now what is happening is, the library has been designed in a certain manner, but as soon as you start running it, the fundamental assumption is, is breaking apart, so you don't get the best solution. So the, now the question is again, bringing back the example of the driving and the DLA framework, you need to somehow, if you can detect what is the underlying topology. And you have flexibility, saying okay, if I discover the topology and I know my job is fragmented, then instead of using algorithm one, I switch to algorithm two or switch to algorithm three, then you should be able to, to get good performance. Is, is the idea clear? Okay. So, so here what we did this study, it is, um, the, it is a simplified version. We had the collectives, but what I am reporting here is just the placement. Okay. So think of like, let's say I got some, uh, I have to run a 4,000 core job. The scheduler gave me 4,000 cores but which rank goes to which core? That also makes a big difference in the performance. So what we try to do here, this is trying to show on the tax stampede, um, uh, sorry, this is the previous, the Ranger system. On the default, 2048 core run, here if you see like the 
how much is intranode communication, how much is one hop communication, three hop, five hop, seven hop communication. And we did this like, as you know, the InfiniBand open, open um, subnet manager allows you to get the topology. So we, we wrote some tools to discover this network topology from like order of n square host to order of n host. So as the job gets launched, we get the topology and, and we internally reorder based on some information from the application saying who is communicating to whom. Okay. And if we put it together, this is how the end run looks like. So here you see that this is like the intranode portion we are able to significantly improve. So those ranks which were communicating more frequently, we are able to bring it to the within the node. And at the same time also we reduce the one hop communication, three hops, five hops, seven hops, because this is where you get a lot of contention from other jobs. And if we can reduce those kind of a communication, then the contention reduces. And here we see almost like a, on a 2,000, 2K core job, we get around like 15% improvement. Okay? And this we presented at like the SC12, um, uh, um, more details are, are available. So then the next example here is the power aware collective. So I, I indicated this earlier, like the collectives you are continuously pulling, okay? And then this is where a lot of energy goes. Of course, people have used some DVFS kind of solution, like saying when you are trying to do some collectives, try to reduce the voltage, reduce the frequency, so you save on the power. But what we found out that if you just blindly follow that thing, you may get some improvement, but may not be the best. Okay? So the common example, think of like a football game. I mean, here is the Stanford or any, any, any of your university or uh, town where games are being played. If the football games get done, Everybody starts moving, right? But then nobody moves, right? So you are just idling, and this is where like you are spending energy and in this, on the system context where you are consuming the power. So the question is, this is where like all the police, cops come in, okay? So they always plan some the best way, saying, okay, you people hold on, let this traffic go. Then the next moment, okay, you hold on to that, this traffic goes. So if we think that kind of an example and trying to design the collectives, Okay, we'll be able to get much more performance, and that's what we demonstrated in this this uh, an all to all. So very simple. What we did is like let's say you have um, uh, 16 cores. Don't allow all 16 cores to inject messages. So you can divide it into different groups. Like let's say two groups of eight or four groups of four. Then you say okay, first these four groups you communicate. The other three groups are not doing anything. Reduce the power significantly. Okay. So then in the next phase you bring the other four groups up. Okay? So in that way, you will be able to make progress on the communication and at the same time also to reduce the power. So we need to rethink in that manner and design this kind of next generation collective algorithms to give you the best performance at the same time also reduce the, um, uh, the power. Any questions so far on these two, two parts? Okay. So next, let's, uh, next section I want to show the integrated support for GP, GPUs, and, and mic. Now, if you think of like the, the way people are currently using the GPU systems, so here an example, let's say we have the, the data exists on the GPU, people do CUDA mem copy, and then you do a MPI send, and you do MPI receive and CUDA mem copy. So this is a very simple way to program, but then the, if you see the data, it goes through a lot of hops, and this is where the performance suffers. So what we said is that like high productivity, but it's low performance. But of course, there are some advanced users. What they try to do is if you have a huge data buffer there, they try to do pipelining. Okay? So they divide into chunks, and they try to use CUDA mem async copy, and use MPI I send, and finally they do the MPI wait all. So this is delivers good performance, but it's low productivity in the sense these are the end users, like end scientists, end engineers, are trying to understand what is happening at the MPI layer, what is happening at the GPU layer. They should rather focus more on the, their real science. Okay? But eventually they are trying to learn what is happening at the MPI library and then the cluster. So we asked the question that can we have a good design, this is where we introduced the concept, like it has been five years back, called GPU aware MPI library. So the thing is, can, and users just do MPI send and MPI receive, just like they're trying to do from the host memory, can they do it from the, the GPU memory? If, if they can do that, everything else 
can be done within the MCI library. So the end users don't have to be in touch CUDA. Okay? And if we can do that, then that leads to high performance and high productivity. Okay? And this is what we, we started the concept, and then we have been continuing. We had a very close collaboration with, with NVIDIA for the last several years. And this has been, this design has been pushed into not only our MIPs2, but also other MCI libraries also taken the similar kind of a concept, and they have made that uh, GPU aware. And very recently, of course, the GPU direct RDMA has come, um, which allows the data to be moved from GPU buffer to the, to, the, to the network adapter and back and forth over the PCI Express. But at the same time, there is, of course, some chipset bottleneck lies here. So here we are trying to show Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge numbers. If you see this point to point right, like data going from InfiniBand to, to GPU memory is good, but whereas the reading is not that good. Okay. So, so we have some kind of an hybrid design there. And on top of that, we have also been working very closely with Davide Rossotti, who is sitting here. He has come up with a very nice library to move the data, which is called GDR copy library. So if you put everything together and look at the number, this is the number I want to this is like the MPI performance from one GPU to the remote GPU. It is going through InfiniBand, switch, adapters, and everything, and see the latency, 2.18 microseconds. So we can move data from a GPU buffer to a remote GPU buffer with this kind of performance. Okay? Two years back, it used to be here, 20 microseconds. So we have given like almost factor of 10 improvement from, from what was here two years before to, uh, to do this. And that also leads to a lot of improvement in small message bandwidth, like almost by a factor of 10 here, the similar kind of things with, the, with also the bidirectional library. So that means earlier people were thinking only the GPUs you can use only if you have huge amount of data. Okay? But that is not true. If you have jobs have very small amount of data, you can also still use um, at, at the MPI layer and get the benefit. And we have also provided the MPI3 um, RMA support, like whatever the MPI3 RMA. Um, standard allows for CPU level, uh, you can also do, do GPU level. And then we are also working with some of the application folks. So this is an Humdi Blue uh, from University of Michigan, Jens Glacier. So he has taken this, he has modified his application, and these data have been taken from Wilkes uh, system uh, in UK. Uh, so that is the one of the largest system with the GPU and our GPU library, and we are working with the both NVIDIA and Mellanox. So this is a system, and here we see very good strong scalability as well as weak scalability uh, for the GPU applications. So if you have not used all these libraries, I'll strongly encourage you. Um, and uh, just two weeks back, David made this available from NVIDIA, the GDR copy library that was not available. So now you should be able to download our library as well as uh, David's library. And, and with this kind of a combination, uh, in the GDR, uh, GPU Direct RDMA plugin, and the Mellanox OFED, you should be able to get performance, just what I showed here. Okay. Similar kind of things also we are trying to do for the Intel mic. Um, so if you take a look at the Intel mic, of course it has all different kinds of mode, uh, offload mode, symmetric mode, coprocessor mode kind of thing. If you take a look at all these modes, your MPI library has to support, you need to optimize a lot of different communication paths. Okay? So I'll just try to show th through this illustration. So let's say you have a node 0 here, and these are all the places where your MPI process can run, like on the host or on the mic. Uh, there could be multiple mics connected over one PCI bus or across the QPI, the communication has to go. So if you take a detailed analysis of all possible communication paths, so you will come up with this kind of a list like intra-socket, inter-socket, inter-node, intra-mic, intra-socket, inter-socket. So there are 11 possible communication paths you need to optimize okay, to, to support all those modes. Okay? So any MPI library says, OK, I want to deliver the best performance for Intel mic system, you need to optimize all these. That's for point-to-point. -point. So that means it goes for two-sided. It goes for one-sided. On top of that, the collectives come. And that becomes like a nightmare because there are so many paths, so you need to totally redesign or rethink all your collectives. So we have been moving along this line to, to support all these different modes. And here there are some sample numbers. Uh, if you see, of course, the Intel mic, as Intel claims, it is like x86 compatible, so any software will run. So if you take our MAPIS2 or any other MCI library, it will run. But the question is, does it give good performance? So this is where we have been trying to optimize. So here you see this is the 
the mica wire MRBS2 is trying to significantly reduce the latency and, and push the bandwidth. Um, similar kind of things we have done for collectives, the redesigning some of the collectives so that depending on the mode, it will try to give you the, the compared to the default mic, the optimized mic uh, version should be able to give you a um, lot of benefits. So, so for the last year, like some of the large scale systems, they were using our version. It was not publicly released, but in the December, we have made it publicly available. Um, so if you have not got a chance, just download it, and you should be able to run it on your mic system, um, the MRP to mic, um, and, and try to get similar kind of performance. Okay. Any questions on this GPU and mic? Yes. So I think that the map is to GPU side, you can run it on any any system, okay? So whether it has GPU or not GPU, that's fine. But the map is to mic since it requires like this MPS, the different optimizations. So what we suggest is that if you don't have any mic, just use the basic map is to. But if you have a mic system, use the map is to mic. Any other questions? So let me then accelerate a little bit here. Um, the next I'll try to touch the MPI-T interface. So this is the new interface which has been proposed by the MPI-T standard. The idea is that so far, if you think of like your end user, let's say you run a job, you don't get performance, okay? So you don't know where to look for, okay? So this is what the MPI-T interface is trying to help us. It will expose a lot of variables, MPI-T variables to the upper layers so that the tools developers or the end users can actually try to see what is happening. And not only that, it's like a information from MPI library going to the users, but users also will have control to, to drive the MPI library by changing some of the parameters. So this is the new paradigm which is coming up. It is in a very early infancy, but you will see in another three to five years, a lot of this kind of development will take place. So the idea here is that there are some control variables which will get exposed and also performance variables, but you should also be able to drive it, okay? So here, very simple examples I have shown here. Let's say, you know, um, MPI library has a very simple parameter called eager threshold, okay? That means the messages of lower than this go through, go through eager, larger than that go through rendezvous. And of course, rendezvous takes more time. So let's say all the libraries, including our libraries, for different architectures, they put some threshold. So let's say the threshold is 17K. But think of your application, the most common message size is 18K, okay? So that means what is happening is your <coughs> messages are going through rendezvous path and, and performance is being degraded. Now the question is if you can detect that at the runtime, like make the first run, get some numbers. The second onwards, you can actually tell the MPI library to, to move that threshold from 17 to, let's say, 18.5K. Then you will see your job will run faster, okay? So those kind of trying to see, in the next uh, few years, you will see the MPI libraries will, will try to provide this kind of intelligence to, to the end users, and that is the whole idea of the, of the MPI tree interface. Now let me touch some of the hybrid programming I indicated earlier, like uh, the need for, like let's say, not only to run MPI, as well as UPC, as well as OpenSMEM or CAF, uh, so we have this version MHAPIS 2X, which tries to provide the unified support, okay? So that means your job, it, you, you can use this stack to, to run not only pure MPI OpenMP, you can run pure OpenSMEM, you can run pure UPC, MPI OpenMP, OpenSMEM, or MPI OpenMP UPC. So any of this combination, you should be able to, to, to run. And here, I'm trying to show some pure just OpenSMEM um, applications, like uh, I think PASA had introduced some of these stacks. This is the uh, University of Houston Open SMEM. This is the Open MPI SMEM. This is the Scalable SMEM. And this is the MAP is to X SMEM. And here we are trying to show some different applications here, heat image and DAXP. And you can see across the stack, uh, we are able to deliver very good performance with the, with the MAP is to X. But the more important is this hybrid, OK? So here we have done ourselves, like we have taken some few examples. This is the uh, Graph 500. as some of you know it is very irregular. There are different MPI versions out there, but these MPI versions don't scale. So what we did is we analyzed this, the graph 500, and found out that some kernels 
are not well suited for the MPI. Okay? And those kernels we modified to, to run with OpenSmem, and then we put together this program. This is the hybrid program, MPI and, and OpenSmem. And here, if you see, this is on tag stampede. On 16K cores, we are able to give you almost factor of 13 improvement. So single MPI is not able to do it. OpenSmem is not able to do it. But if you run this hybrid, then you should be able to, to get this kind of performance. And it also gives you very good strong scalability um, as well as uh, weak scalability. And the other one is a sort. That also similar kind of things what, what we have done here. And here also you will see that of a 4 terabyte data, you can get like a 51% improvement. So, so these are just some like sample things what we have done. And we are working actually with some of the other our collaborators. And if you have any applications you would like to work with us, I, uh, please contact me. Uh, we'll be able to work you and then see how we can take your applications and convert it into this hybrid to, to deliver more performance and, and scalability. Then very recently, we have been working on this, this uh, CoRA Fortran support. There are a lot of scientific applications out there. Um, so this is like the new design which, which we are working on. Um, so that you can go through the open US compiler to generate the leaf calf and then trying to do it over the um, MVAP is to X. And here are some very sample numbers. This paper just have been submitted. Um, so here you can see like get and put. Uh, we can give you almost factor of like three improvement, even some like NAS applications with core Fortran. At an application level, we can give you like a 12% to 18% um, improvement the similar kind of things of the collective. So our next release, you will see the CoRA Fortran support will be, will be available, so you should be able to um, utilize it. Now let me just touch in the next five minutes, the final thing is the virtualization. And as I indicated, virtualization has a lot of benefits, like job migration, compaction, but they're not very popular. Um, of course, the, the Mellanox infinite solution with SRIOB support is trying to help us with that. Now what we are trying to do is, Combining this SRIOB support with OpenStack and trying to bring it together with MVAPIS2 so that you can have a very high performance design um, of MPI stack for virtualization. And in few weeks, you will see we'll be able to make a publicly public release. Um, and here I'm trying to show some numbers. So this is the basic IB level performance. So if you think the IB native and IB SRIOB, no MPI is here. So IBS RIOB from Mellanox still has a little bit of overhead, um, uh, like at the, for the lower message sizes. And we have built on top of that our, our MPI stack. And here we are also comparing with the Amazon EC2. Okay? That is, of course, a 10 gigi. So you will see a big, uh, big difference here. But the major thing is like, let's say you take this, uh, the default MPI with SRIOB, but this is our optimized design. We come very close. With respect to internode, we for the intra node we can significantly benefit you. We have taken some locality aware designs and all. Uh, how the multiple VMs can talk to using very efficient shared memory, just like our earlier shared memory design. Um, so here you will see that compared to the native, we are able to give you like within three to seven percent of the overhead for the latency and and bandwidth. And then some application numbers, similar kind of things you will see. This is like the Let's say uh, this is the default, uh, this is the optimized, and this is the native. That means without virtualization. So we are able to deliver you very close to the, to the performance, what you can get without virtualization. And, and with that, we hope that HPC and the virtualization field, these two can be combined together. And a lot of this cloud environment can actually start using that. And we are actually a part of this bigger project, which just got funded uh, through NSF called Chameleon Project. Um, it is a joint project uh, between TAC, uh, Argon, OSU, and uh, San Antonio and Northwestern University. So this is a cloud environment to design the next generation cloud. Okay, it's not for end users. It is for computational science researchers to experiment with new designs of how the next generation cloud will be available. So, so our solution will be actually deployed here. Um, so take a look at this chameleon uh, for more details. So just to wind up, I mean, we are continuously, as I said, we have been working in this field for the last 15 years and continuously looking at how the field is moving. And we're trying to take care of all the latest developments and trying to put it through our MAPIS2 stack so that the end users can um, see the benefits. So at a higher level, you will see the, the exascale 
systems, as I indicated, will be constrained by power, memory per core, data movement cost, and faults. So once you come into the program models and run times, you need to handle all these things. The scalability, performance, fault resilience, energy awareness, programmability, and productivity. I just highlighted some of the issues, uh, but it needs continuous innovation because the hardwares are continuously changing with, with, with uh, newer features. So tomorrow I'll be talking uh, the separate thing on the big data side, how you can take these modern networking technologies uh, to, the, to the big data to, to accelerate them. Uh, these are our standard sponsors. But more importantly, these are all my heroes. Uh, all the last uh, 15 years, all the past students, staff, current students and staff, uh, they do the hard work. I just come and give a talk. Okay? So, uh, so I always like want to publicly acknowledge all their contributions. Uh, so with this, let me stop here. Um, if there is any quick question, I can handle this. Otherwise, I am here throughout the today and tomorrow, and we'll have a lot of time to, to discuss. Uh, thank you.